There are those who say it's got a face that only a mother could love. And mothers the world over are thankful for the day that Lockheed created the Hercules. And just like the mythical hero of the ancient Greek tales, this Hercules too has performed legendary feats of strength and daring throughout the world. In the turbulent world of geopolitics, this Hercules has truly done it all. This is a story about the Hercules and Africa about civil war and famine and the world's response to the suffering of the people of South Sudan as seen through the windshield of a herc, through the eyes of the people who flew it and kept it flying. Most of all, it is a personal memoir about a place and a plane and friends now gone or moved on to other things. But once upon a time, a crisis brought us all together to rescue a Sudanese city on the western bank of the River Nile. to all concerned parties. We again inform and alert the international community and their representatives as to what is happening in the Equatoria provincial capital of Juba, as well as Torit and Ye. We refer to our previous appeal of September 24, 88, where we requested that the international community exercise all means to facilitate the guarantee of adequate and safe airlifts to Juba airport of urgently needed relief food to avert an imminent catastrophe. The Juba airport, despite claims to the contrary by the government of Sudan, is neither open nor safe. Indeed, all three carriers which have flown in the past have now stopped flying. Nile Safaris Aviation and Sudan Air have both been shot upon and both sustained serious damages. No relief planes, however, have arrived since our appeal was made and only a few flights have come from the international donors over the past several months. In addition, no convoy has arrived since September when the virtually unguarded section of the convoy carrying WFP relief supplies was destroyed with many Kenyan drivers and civilians killed and eight vehicles destroyed. The situation is now desperate in both Juba and Ye. Torit is even worse off with already hundreds of reported deaths due to starvation. Reports from there now tell of a completely helpless population, including Christians and Muslims who have joined together in a common prayer for mercy. The population of Juba and Ye is estimated to be well over 150,000 and 100,000 respectively, and virtually without food. Everyone is starving. The little food that remains in the markets is priced well beyond the means of all but a few, and many commodities are now totally unavailable to all. The little supply of relief food available to cart is now being exclusively allocated to wet feeding kitchens, which are spread out all over Juba and Ye, with priority given to the most vulnerable, children, the aged, and women, and without distinction between the displaced and resident population. Many people would like to return to the camps, where unharvested food crops exist, or to the countryside, where one can still eke out an existence on the wild foods which exist there. But the people are afraid to move. 
Over 20 civilians have been killed in the past two weeks by anti-personnel mines which have been placed on the paths by the Army and the SPLA. The people, the innocent civilians, are caught in a real life-and-death catch-22 situation. The world community needs to be aware of the extent of the suffering to which these people are being subjected. A similar scenario, like the secret slaughter which has transpired in Bar el Ghazal and Upper Nile provinces, is now quickly unfolding in Equatoria province. The world community would be outraged at the grossest violation of human rights of an innocent and helpless civilian population. Will it now sit by and watch another 300,000 people starve to death in Equatoria? We, as the combined agency's relief team, are impatient and outraged by the fruitless appeals that have been made so often by so many to the combatants in this conflict. We therefore call upon the government of Sudan and the SPLA, SPLM, demanding that they respect the human rights of the civilian population caught up in this war. Furthermore, we call upon the international community as the major donors of relief supplies to ensure that adequate amounts are given to responsible bodies who will be accountable to the people now suffering. The protection of the human rights of the people of southern Sudan should be pursued vigorously and unreservedly. Sincerely, Combined Agencies Relief Team, Juba, October 21, 1988. Since 1983, Sudan, Africa's largest and one of its poorest countries, has again been at war with itself. The fighting is confined to the southern third of the country. Much of it is now accessible to a well-armed rebel force, the Sudan People's Liberation Army. Government forces hold Juba, the largest town in the south. They also control most of the other main southern towns. In the south of Sudan, Juba, the regional capital, was being surrounded by rebel forces. Juba is beside the River Nile and like most large cities was entirely dependent on food brought in from producers in the countryside. Imported commodities like fuel and medical supplies came from Kenya and Uganda by road and from Khartoum by riverboat. Juba's population of 100,000 had more than doubled by the fleeing of people from the countryside. The farms became deserted, so Juba became almost entirely dependent on food convoys from outside Sudan. The river route had been cut by the fighting. Following a serious attack on a large convoy in September 1988, the convoys stopped and Juba was in serious danger of mass starvation. Convoys such as this one attempting to reach Ye to the west of Juba have been ambushed and many lives and vehicles lost. For the drivers and civilians walking with the convoy, it was three minutes of pure terror. One boy died after being shot in the head, and two young men had their legs blown off by the mine which destroyed this truck. Both died in agony. The state of Juba's hospital is a graphic example of the effects of the war. Here, surgeons are carrying out an emergency hernia operation, in normal circumstances, a routine procedure. But the medical staff cannot get any general anaesthetic. The war has prevented supplies from reaching them. The rebels have recently been as near as three miles from the center of town. As they've come closer, more people have been injured by their anti-personnel mines. But life-saving surgery is often frustrated by a simple lack of medicines. The conflict has left the hospital with few essential drugs. Some victims die of tetanus after amputations. This man was lucky. He survived despite losing a leg. Juba was once a thriving market town, a meeting point between East and West Africa. But its agricultural potential has never been realized because of continuous disruption. Before the war, Juba was the base for a multi-million pound development effort in the South. There were at least 30 international aid agencies here. Now there are four. The cruel realities of the conflict have brought 100,000 destitute southerners into the town, doubling its population. 
This was once a primary school. Now it is a makeshift settlement camp, home for scores of displaced families. Most of Juba's schools have been closed since teachers went on strike last November. They didn't feel they could go on teaching while children and staff were collapsing from hunger. Juba is a government stronghold, but it is besieged by rebels who have threatened to shoot down any planes entering their territory. We control this airspace. Anything that flies over this airspace that does not have permission from us will be shot down. 23 October 1988. To Oxfam, Ethiopia. Attention, Nick Weiner. UN refugee relief convoy turned back yesterday, seven kilometers from Juba. UN in New York issued instructions that UN flags be withdrawn after being told by SPLA it will destroy anything on the road. SPLA claims the convoy was an evacuation of Sudanese and not a repatriation of refugees. Attitude appears inconsistent given frequent requests over SPLA radio for inhabitants to leave town. Air evacuation of more than 30 expats from Juba should have begun today. Two planes would have been used over two days, a Nile Safari Cessna 404 and a UNICEF Twin Otter. Yesterday received news that UNICEF's attempt to negotiate clearance had failed. SPLA said it would shoot down anything that flies. Planes have been withdrawn. Gordon and Jimmy were scheduled to leave on 404 tomorrow. Oxfam Sudan views this intransigence with great concern since it greatly increased risks for the two staff we wish to remove. Regards, Marco. Six years of fighting in the south have placed the lives of thousands increasingly in the hands of international aid agencies. This is a relief flight carrying grain to the southern town of Juba. You get 3,000 people on this frequency. Once we get into about 30 miles from Juba, when we start our descent, they can, uh, the rebels are there under normal conditions you will start descending at approximately 45 to 50 miles out, okay? Here you're gonna be spiraling down right over the airport. Why is that? Well, due to the fact that you cannot fly low and under the uh, rebel-held territory because they can get you with small arms. So therefore, you try to stay within the airport area. That's the reason for the spiral. You just gotta be on the lookout. You never know what could happen. Last autumn, the rebels started shooting at commercial cargo flights coming into Juba. They said they were also carrying military supplies for the government. The two and a half hour flight is routine to the experienced crews. But there are occasional reminders that they are flying into a war zone. Although the planes are regarded as neutral by both sides, mistakes can happen, so the pilots put the plane into a dramatic downward spiral at 18,000 feet, directly over Juba, and three full circles later, they land. <laughs> These planes, chartered by church and aid agencies, fly in at considerable risk to bring food for thousands of people trapped in a town with no other link with the outside world. It was just weeks ago we were flying famine relief missions next door in Ethiopia. It was there in the town of Aware that we first heard reports of starving Sudanese crossing the border in search of food. The assessment team sent to examine these refugees said they were in worse shape than the Ethiopians, worse shape even than the survivors of the Cambodian death march. In response to those reports, the UN World Food Program chartered a HERC from Southern Air Transport for a 30-day contract hauling grain from the Entebbe Airport in Uganda 
to the city of Juba in Sudan's Equatoria province. No one knew then, or at least no one understood, the true extent of the civil war raging in South Sudan, or of how famine was being used by both sides as a weapon of war. Juba was once an important city in East Africa, a provincial capital famed both for its university and its nightlife. The flying boats of Britain's Imperial Airways used to night stop there on the long journey from England to South Africa. They would land on the Nile just south of the city, and their passengers and crew would spend time in Juba for rest and recreation. Kenya's famous aviatrix, Beryl Markham, wrote about her early life as a charter pilot flying in East Africa and how much she looked forward to getting out of the social backwater of Nairobi and up to the more lively and exciting Juba. Back then, Nairobi was just a cow town, a tech stop to take on wooden water for the trains of the famous Lunatic Express transiting from Mombasa on Kenya's Indian Ocean coast to Kampala in Uganda, a place Winston Churchill once called the Pearl of Africa. On the first flights into Juba, I was shocked at the sight of the emaciated work gang that met us to unload the airplane. They were so weak from hunger, it took more than two hours to unload the bags of grain. But, after a couple of weeks of eating regular meals, they had cut that time to 45 minutes. A few weeks more, and they were turning the airplane around in under 20. From high above Juba, we could see the sprawling refugee camp spreading out beyond the edge of the city toward the River Nile. Below us, knots of people watched our progress as we circled ever lower on our approach to the airport. Looking at the multitude below, we talked among ourselves about what was it like living in a refugee camp? What were they like? And so a plan was formed that on our next day off, we'd hitch a ride up to Juba to visit with these people, to try and gain a better understanding of the effectiveness of what we were doing. Were we actually doing something good? Were we accomplishing anything useful? Our sojourn began at the ramshackle building that served as a combination passenger terminal and control tower. We walked through the double doors and met our guide in the street outside. Our guide told us that word had gotten out that we were coming, and the refugee camp was buzzing with excitement at the prospect of seeing one of the crews who had come to their rescue. They knew we were Americans. Most had never met an American before, but interestingly, everyone we met seemed to know the names of two Americans. Muhammad Ali and Michael Jackson. We even saw posters of them hanging on the doors of a shop as we passed by on our way to the camp. We were driven through town in the back of a pickup truck holding on to a metal bar and waving like it was the Pope Mobile. Wherever we went, people stopped, smiled, and waved back at us. Our first stop was the Catholic Cathedral. Juba is an archdiocese and the Archbishop had established a feeding center at his official seat. The bill of fare on offer was not particularly appetizing. Ground maize meal mixed with sugar and oil and cooked in old 55-gallon barrels balanced on some stones above an open fire. Until the airlift began, however, the only source of food for these refugees was a weed-choked pond at the end of the runway. The people harvested the seed pods at the center of what looked like lily pads and spread them to dry in the hot sun then pounded the dried seeds with sticks and a stone vessel until they became a kind of flour, then cooked that to mush in those dirty barrels. I didn't realize until later that I had witnessed something of a miracle. That lily pond that sustained these people in their time of need dried up shortly after we began flying food into the beleaguered city. I had assumed it was a regular artifact of the rainy season. But in all of the subsequent years that we flew relief missions into Juba, and they were many, that pond never appeared again. After the cathedral, we drove on to the refugee camp we had seen on our descent. There the people were as curious about us as we were about them. As was the case at the cathedral, everyone was glad to see us. Wherever we stopped, a crowd would quickly gather to stare and wave. Along the way, we often saw poignant scenes of children, some fetching and carrying water from the only source available, the river, or looking after a little brother or sister. The war tore families apart and left many children orphaned, most famously a wandering band of orphans known simply as Sudan's Lost Boys. At the camp feeding center, some kids crowded round to meet us, 
while others just sat and waited patiently for their next meal. Mark, the flight engineer, wanted to do something special on this visit, so he brought an old pair of sneakers he wanted to give away as a gift to some needy child. He picked out one young girl from the crowd and gave her the shoes, probably the first shoes she'd ever owned. When he held out the first shoe to put on her foot, every nearby child raised a foot in unison. As he went to put on the other, every child raised the other foot, as if hoping they might share in the gift of the remaining shoe. There were so many people who had absolutely nothing. The lesson I learned that day was, while it was not possible to save the life of any particular individual, by doing our job to the best of our ability, it was possible to rescue an entire city. But that optimistic assessment had to be tempered by the sad realization that while we were able to save many, there were some few for whom our help had come too late. Our final stop was at a preschool that had been set up to try and restore some sense of normalcy and routine to the lives of the children displaced by the war. Soon, however, in some ways too soon, and in others not soon enough, our guide's radio crackled with the news that the day's last flight was inbound. It was time to get back to the airport to catch our ride home to Entebbe. At the airport, a delegation of mothers was waiting for us. They had come to present us with a gift. Nothing much, really. Just a homemade shirt made from what felt like the woven plastic upholstery of a 56 Chevy and a Sudanese pipe. We had seen many like it at the camp, made with a wooden bowl and brass fittings. The brass was from spent shell casings picked up in the wake of a rebel attack on the city. A humble gift from some humble people. But to this day, those presents remain among my most cherished possessions. That day spent in the company of these simple and humble people provided the most powerful experience any of us could remember. But there was one more thing to come something that would have a profound impact on us all. It took the form of a letter sent by that mother's group and addressed to everyone involved in the airlift, a letter in which they expressed their heartfelt gratitude for what we were doing. It was a letter that would change my life forever. American pilots. The armed conflict in the Sudan has imposed a serious threat to the lives of women, causing constant fear, displacement, destruction, etc. Thousands of civilians are today dying from starvation, and women and children in particular are the first victims. For the last two months, an average family in Jewish towns in South Sudan have been unable to get at least a meal a day due to complete lack of food commodities in the market. Thus, mortality rate in Torit is currently reported at 25 daily. Urban populations have all through been surviving on wild foods and vegetables. The urban centers used to depend on rural communities who were selling their surplus food products. Unfortunately, these communities have been displaced in the urban centers and they too have become helpless. The planes which were flying food down to the Sudan have been frightened off by SPLA. The incident in Malakal where a civilian plane was shot down is still fresh in people's minds. And since attempts have been made to down this plane, they stopped operation. Supply routes to all major towns in South Sudan have been blocked. Thus being relief surplus were supplies were killed as a result of their existence. Even national subsistence neighboring countries who came to our rescue were killed in cold blood. We in southern Sudan have given up 
hope of living in this world. But one fine day we saw a plane in the air. We could not believe our ears and eyes, but we saw a miracle. A foreign plane flew in. The women of Victoria would like to take this opportunity to register a vote of thanks to WFP for spearheading relief operation in Southern Sudan. In particular, you, the young and courageous American pilots who showed the way by risking your fear after everybody had deserted us deserve a special note of credit from women and children in Juba. Morale has been boosted and underquained by the more appearance of a plane in our skies. We are now confident that in the, if the unfortunate incident in Hiroshima were to repeat itself in South and Sudan, then someone in, our, in your persons will have seen the disaster and reported it to the rest of the world. of congratulations and thanks once again from us all. Please inform World Food Program and the rest of the world that although you came in rather late, it meant something. What have I ever come so far as you know there's only a drop in the ocean. Inform the rest of the world and the church communities in particular that they should be served for us a little of the daily bread. We need clothes, shelter, and medicines as well. Above all, let them assist the Sudan in bringing about peace in the country. The war is weighing heavily on women and children. It must end. And someone has to intervene. Accept this small gift, dear brother and sons from the women and children of Victoria and the Sudan in general. This is no way comparable to the risk you undertook to fly to this deserted land. But it's a sign of our gratitude. We beg the Almighty God through His Son Jesus Christ our Lord to prolong your life in this world so as to continue serving His sheep. Thanks also to your families and the American people for sacrificing your lives to our cause. May God be with us all. We hope to see you all in Juba when we attain peace. Bravo once again. Sincerely yours. Margaret Joan Lado and Rob Hadrayata for the women of Victoria. The relief of the city of Juba, christened by the local newspapers the Suicide Airlift, was, by all accounts, a success. But it was not without cost. We lost one airplane due to mechanical failure. Amazingly, the crew walked away from the crash with only scratches and bruises. In fact, the loadmaster was back at it on his regular rotation less than a week later. That the crew not only survived, but emerged unhurt was certainly a tribute both to the Hercules and to the Lockheed Corporation which built it right. In time, another Herc would be lost to treachery, but that is a story for another day. Oh, on the ride back to the airport on the day of our visit to the refugee camp, our guide told us about the plight of some Kenyan truck drivers who had survived an ambush some months before. They were now stuck in Juba, sheltering under their trucks and trailers, and trying to survive on that lily pad mush in Nile River water. Kurt, our captain, spoke up and said, We can fly them in their trucks back, you know. We go back empty anyway. Apparently, nobody had realized the Herc could do that. So, for the next couple of weeks, on each return trip, we flew a truck or a trailer or one of the escort vehicles, plus the drivers and helpers, back to Entebbe. On the way, we'd share our crew meals with them, the first real food they'd had in quite some time. While they enjoyed the ride, the loadmaster would go back and slap an I Love My Herc sticker on the truck. 
at Entebbe, the UN would fill the fuel tank and send them on their way back to the homes they despaired of ever seeing again. Sometime after the airlift began, a U.S. delegation led by New Hampshire's junior senator, Gordon Humphrey, himself a U.S. air captain, arrived to negotiate a safe conduct for the airlift. John Garang and the SPLA initially agreed to 30 days, but a wave of publicity favorable to his cause convinced Garang to make the safe conduct permanent. What began as a 30-day contract to airlift food to one besieged city became a near 20-year commitment to the whole of South Sudan. Administered by the UN World Food Program under the rubric Operation Lifeline Sudan, we first moved our planes from Entebbe to Kenya's capital city, Nairobi, and later to a place called Lokachokio, a small village with a dirt runway on the Kenya-Uganda-Sudan border. As OLS expanded, Loki, as it was called, became both the gateway to South Sudan and Kenya's busiest airport, with more annual flight operations than Nairobi, Mombasa, and Eldoret combined. An additional flight operation headed by Bob Cope, a fellow American, was undertaken by the Lutheran World Federation. Based in Nairobi, the Lutherans provided airlift capacity to smaller church groups and non-governmental organizations who could not otherwise afford to charter an airplane on their own. For his part, John Garang was transformed from a rebel leader to something of a George Washington figure, and in many ways, the father of his country. The last time I saw John Garang was at the airfield in Lokachokio in 2005. I was waiting at the small terminal building for a flight to Nairobi and home. Garang was catching a flight to the town of Machakos in Kenya for the peace conference that would eventually agree to let the people of the South decide by a referendum whether they wanted to remain part of a greater Sudan or if they wanted their independence. We nodded politely to each other. He had no recollection he had once put a price on my head. Now the old animosities were long behind us. All he knew was that I was one of the Kawaja pilots based at Loki. Though I didn't know it at the time, this would prove to be my last ever trip to Sudan. And John Garang, he was killed in a helicopter crash later that same year. They say it has a face that only a mother could love. But they said the same thing about me. I guess that's why I can relate to this old airplane so well. I've been flying this airplane for 15 years now. And this year marks the 50th anniversary that the Hercules has uh, been in the air. This particular airplane behind me used to belong to Southern Air Transport, and it has spent a lot of years up here in Lokachokio uh, delivering relief supplies to the people in the Southern Sudan. Sudan.